Most people focus on the possibilities and ignore the probabilities. But the probability is most of us will live to 70. I'd rather be a 70, 89 year old with some type of investments that I started putting ideally away in my 20s. Are you ready to transform your life? This is a no-nonsense show helping immigrants like you create generational wealth, even while working full time. Get ready to take notes. Here's your host, Socket Jane. Welcome back, my great two wealth listeners. Today, we're speaking with Marcus Garrett. Marcus, how are you? I'm pretty good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so I thought bringing Marcus would be a great idea because one of the things that I'm getting a constant feedback from my audience, which is probably all of you guys, is really around, hey, we talk about gaining financial freedom. Some of us are heavy debt, and these are consumer debt, right? These are not necessarily debt on the homes. They're credit card and whatnot. So we thought Marcus would be a great addition to this our list of speakers here as a guest. And Marcus is focusing predominantly on debt reduction. He has a book, he has a few different podcasts, kind of like Marcus. With that very high level introduction, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, the book that I wrote is Debt Free or Die, trying available on Amazon. I released two of those. And today I'm the host of Life After Debt with the Marcus Garrett, where I interview your favorite influencers and entrepreneurs for their motivational money stories around life after debt. Awesome, Marcus. We'll get right on there, man. So Marcus, the name of our show is Migrate to Wealth. One of the key things we want to understand is how did you get to, what was your migration to whatever you do? How did you get to do what you're doing? Well, I'm an auditor by trade, so I've always been fascinated by numbers. And I guess my aha moment where I wasn't going to migrate to wealth was I was 27 years old and I had just moved. I was working three jobs and I was moving to pay off what would ultimately become the life that I was living that was debt free or die trying. I was living it before I wrote the book. And I pulled out a spreadsheet. And because I worked in the public sector and government, for those who are not familiar, I knew what I was going to make for the next 20 to 30 years. I did a cost of living adjustment. I did three, five, seven percent. I curled it down the spreadsheet or slid it down the spreadsheet for the next 20 years. And it was a very small number. (laughs) So when I got to the end of that 20 year period, I I was depressed and I was like, I need to make a change here. And I did not realize I didn't even have the terms for it. Then I was going to make a pivot, but I just didn't know what I was going to call it at that time. Mm -hmm. And what made you go through that exercise, Marcus? Because it's not like you one day you wake up and just say, I'm going to look at the spreadsheet and develop a spreadsheet. So something was going on in your life, probably. I don't know if, I don't know if you can pinpoint to that. Well, I had already gone through my buried in debt story. The reason I had moved for that job was to make more money. So I did get a 40% increase. I will share that one thing that I've also talked about now is I didn't negotiate my salary. I didn't even know how to negotiate my mm, salary. Uh, right. So I asked for 70000 just because it sounded like a big number. They said yes so quickly that to this day, I still wonder what I could have asked for. Yeah. I'm going through that period. If I had to guess, I was talking to my mentor who was at that time my supervisor. I think I got passed up for a promotion. I know I was 27. Mm. I came in as a lead auditor and there was a supervisor opportunity and I didn't get it. And so, I just, you know, you get in that reflection point when things like that happen, or maybe that's yeah. an inflection point. And I'm like, where's my life going? That kind of existential period. And I think that's why I pulled out that Excel spreadsheet. And I was like, you know, this isn't going to allow me to live the life that I would want to live. Yeah. At that time, what would have that life look like? I've actually gotten better at describing it. I think like maybe 27 year olds or most younger individuals, I want to be offensive to the mature audience that may be listening to your show. I thought money would, you know, buy happiness, buy freedom. I only knew how to trade time for money. But what I realized later in life is that I was actually in pursuit of freedom and money for the lifestyle that I wanted to live was a tool Mm. for achieving that. And now, even 13 years later, I, once again, I'm re-engineering what life will be like for me. And it's still that freedom component, but it looks differently. Now I'm like, I want to live a legacy. I want to do something that makes a difference in the world instead of crunching spreadsheets like I did 13 yeah. years earlier, which was sufficient enough for me, but it's not anymore. Got it. So now you had that epiphany that you want to live a different life. And one of the key components always is trying to figure out where the finances are today. Because, you know, most of us are actively involved in our business or our work or our jobs or whatever. And we're active involvement. So how did you get to your freedom? Help us explain that path, Marcus. 
It took two paths. So fortunately, that story did have a happy ending at 27. And it was the second time at 22 was the first time. That's when I mm -hmm. in the book, what I call rock bottom. I missed a credit card <laughs> payment and my interest rate went to 29.9 percent overnight. And I knew right. that I wasn't going to be able to continue to make my payment. So that's when I started looking for this job. 27, I ultimately land the job and I was able to make more money at one job than I was working three jobs at 22. So then at 27, I guess my aha moment was, OK, I need to get out of debt again, trading time for money. Mm -hmm. I thought, you know, if I get out of debt, that'll be the end of the journey. Was able right. to do that. I used a number of different plans, Snowball, Avalanche. I talk about all those in the book. I was able to get out of debt at age 30, which then allowed me to start pivoting towards, I guess, what your show would call or what people would call wealth and financial freedom. But I think people probably mm -hmm. listening would doing that math at home, getting out of debt isn't financial freedom. That was like a mistake that I had made. Or it might have been the only path I could take because I didn't pursue both. I singularly focused on getting out of debt, not building wealth. So I was able to make another pivot once I got that debt behind me. Got it. So now looking back, let's actually talk about debt, right? When you were talking about debt on your end, you mentioned credit card. Looking back now, because I'm pretty sure you have learned a lot of different things along your way, as you have helped yourself and many others, what does getting out of debt mean? Are we saying debt is zero or are we saying getting out of bad debt? How do you define that? At that time, it was zero. I got my debt down to zero. And I say that at that mm -hmm. time because me and the wife and I have recently bought a home. Yeah. So for people in that analogy, you know, that's a 30 year investment, depending on your perspective. Usually we're talking about debt everything except for the home. So in my particular case, I paid off all my credit cards, personal loan, school loan, and a car loan that I had. I got all my debt down to zero by age 30. Except the home, correct? I didn't buy the home until 39. I was a late bloomer. Got it, got it, got it, got it, got it. So let me just make sure I understand this. So we were talking about the consumer debt. Yes. You're talking about stuff that you buy to enjoy. Now, one could argue home is also, you also buy home to enjoy, but we're basically talking about it's essentially being a liability. It's not really building anything for you. Buying an expensive car could be one of that. Buying credit card to fund your, taking on credit card debt to fund your vacations could be another one. Stuff like that is really what you're talking about at that stage. That's what predominantly what you had as debt. Is that correct, realization, Marcus? Yeah, I look at it as two ways. Predominantly everything that I had at that time, I think universally would be described as bad debt with some limited okay. perspectives. I wasn't going to use that term, so I wanted to make sure that, <laughs> no, that came no, from I, you. I, I would say that. I understand true. that. Okay. Then I think the other perspective of the debt that I wanted to pay off was very personal to me. I felt mm -hmm. burdened by it. I felt like it was dragging me down yeah. and I felt like it was holding me back from the life that I wanted to have. So there was some emotional tie to it. It's changed a little bit since, you know, inflation yeah. and everything like that. But the back in the day, I guess I'm old enough to say that now, it was about 7%. So if you have debt with an interest rate of under 7%, broadly, don't want to get an argument about it, but broadly, I would say, you know, I'm not going to call that good debt, but that's a reasonable debt to manage. That was literally the number that uh, mm -hmm. you know, a financial planner used. Everything that had 7% interest or higher were paying off. In my case, because it was all bid debt, it all had higher than 7%. It all had so higher than 7%. It's very easy to say that pay it all off. Do you remember why you guys landed at 7%? I'd have to guess, I think that was the average interest rate for student loans at that time. Or and then also, or was it because the stock market on an average has returned 7%? Was it for that reason? That, it's probably the combination of the two. Like that's, you know, it's hard to talk about debt and reasonable and bad, but that is a reasonable balance of debt to pay interest rate on. Anything under that, you can consider low interest debt, I would start to say. Got it. I mean, we, we talked about historically low averages back then because this was 2008, nine for people to oh, kind of run yeah, some man. numbers. Correct. Okay. Now that makes sense. So now let's fast forward it. Whatever you wanted to accomplish at that time, you were able to do that several years later, which is great. Congrats for that. If you were to go back and change your debt free strategy, what would that look like now? I'm going to answer the emotional side and the logical side. I'm an auditor. So I'll start with the logical yeah, side. That's so fine. on the logical side, I wish I had tackled the debt and the wealth building at the same time. So because I was in government, I had a pension plan. I started mm -hmm. a 401k and I used an index fund, but not with any type of sophisticated analysis. I literally went because they had a free wealth training to yeah. AACREF. It was a great company. Yeah. I'll go ahead and plug them. I don't get paid by them, but they were a great company. <laughs> they signed me up for a 401k plan. Actually, mm -hmm. it was 457k because it was government. They pulled all my investments into one account. 
from the emotional side of it, one thing, and I've actually cautioned a lot of friends and even clients that I work with is, you know, so that's three years, which isn't the longest period of time in, in life, but it felt like I was so singularly focused on that. I actually told a friend recently that it felt like I lived life through Facebook. So I watched marriages on Facebook and kids be born and life just happened on Facebook. And I'm like, ah, I got to pay off this debt right now. I can't be a mm. part of this experience. And so I really caution, I, I offer that as a cautionary tale to people. Uh, there are certain experiences that you cannot recreate. Generally speaking, you can always make more money, but you cannot recreate yeah. certain experiences again. Let me make sure I understand that. So let me reiterate that because I think it's a very powerful point if I'm saying it correctly. I think what you're basically saying is you're so burdened with the debt you had that when you say you were living life through Facebook, you're basically saying is that your own life, you didn't necessarily spend time with your kids or your wife or your friends or whoever you had at that time. You were basically reliving through that from Instagram or Facebook post like, oh, yeah, you're right. That happened in my life. We may be physically present, but you are not mentally and emotionally present. Is that a correct statement, Marcus? Yeah, it's very accurate. And I use Facebook because yeah. I said that was 2008 or nine. So you can plug right. whatever social media it is. To and I think that's a very important thing, right? So I think I always say to everyone that there's two components of any decision making, at least when it comes to finances. There's an emotional component and then there's a financial component. You have to make both these decisions separate and then figure out, is there a compromise for the two decisions, right? Because... If using at a number $2 million is so important to you that you're going to get depressed, that's an emotional decision, most likely. Don't justify that buying a $2 million home is a great financial investment. And it may turn out to be a great financial investment, but it's essentially could very high likely it's a liability, a $2 million, depending on what you're making, right? If you're making hundreds of millions of dollars, $2 million is peanut. If you're making 300, 400 K, a $2 million home, you have to ask yourself, is that truly a financial decision or your emotional state is making you rationalize that as being a financial decision? I like your auditor mindset because I'm, although I'm not an auditor, I always try to separate the logical versus emotional, right? Because most folks from at least my understanding and my dealing with them is really they're making an emotional decision and rationalizing it to be the best financial decision they could make at that time. That may or may not end well. You have zero control on that, right? Right. But if you clearly know, look, it's an emotional decision and I want to make it, that's great. More power to you. And you're okay with it as long as you understand the consequences of that on your financial. For example, if your mortgage payment is $10,000 for kind of house you're looking at, maybe 1.25 or 1.2, 1.7, who knows what the amount is. And you're making $15,000 gross in your income. Buying a $10,000 is not important. It's can you afford that mortgage on a sustainable basis, especially knowing something can happen to your health, your job may get lost or whatever, right? So those are then becomes the non-emotional decision. Emotional decision is I want to buy a $2 million house because of whatever reason you may have, right? And there's no rationalization to emotions. Emotions right. are what they are, right? But as long as you're in touch with that, you're probably going to make a decision which is knowingly what you're making is you're going to be able to handle the impact of that decision much more succinctly and intelligently. Does that make sense? Does that resonate well with you, Marcus? It makes perfect sense. When I wrote my book the second time, I read 22 other personal finance books just to make sure I knew what the hell I was talking about, to be frank. (laughs) One of them, which I actually read when I was 17 the first time and two more times after that was The Millionaire Next Door. Mm -hmm. And in there, there's a little small quote. It's, you know, there's probably two sentences, but it says, if you are not wealthy and you ever want to be, never buy a home that is more than two times your gross income. So people Mm. can do the math at home in your example, 200,000. So you're looking at a 400,000 home, which is much smaller than that emotional $2 billion home. Yeah, But that's the home that you can afford and build wealth from the analysis that they did. So Marcus, that's interesting, right? You hit a point at home, which I want to drive more because given where the markets we're in right now, a 400 home is most markets, they don't have it, right? But the salary of 200K is pretty common. If you were to apply that, now I think folks would say that, no, this is all BS because if I'm living in DC or San Fran or New York or places like even in Raleigh, North Carolina, you can't find a 400K home. I would challenge that, right? I think you can't well. find the home you want for the 400K in the location yes. you are, right? Yeah. The two important things there, what do you want? the kind of home you want, and the location you want. 
if you want to stay in those locations, you may have to lower your expectation of what kind of home you can afford, right? It may end up being a condo. It may end up being whatever it may be. Or you may have to change the location. That say, hey, you want, instead of D.C., I'm going to move to South Carolina. I'm not saying everyone should be able to move. Everyone can move. But these are the decision-making process you have to go through. Because you're in the life, you're only compromising two things, right? You're either compromising your future wealth-building capability, which is one, or you're working yourself to death and you you have a golden handcuff on you, which you're basically saying your job's paying a lot of money, you're unhappy as hell, and you're not enjoying living. Yeah, you live in a mansion of your dreams. But the dream is really a nightmare if you think about that. Right. I agree with everything you said. And I think the key component thematically to what we're talking about here, even in the sentence that I repeated, was if you want to build wealth is how that sentence begins. So if yeah. that's not important to you or that is not a driving factor in your decision, you're like, well, I will sacrifice potentially the opportunity to build wealth if it mm-hmm. puts me in a $2 million home that I want, whatever your reasons may be. And I won't judge what those reasons are. But I think you, as you said, you've gone in there with a clear decision of why you made this Correct. choice, which right. fundamentally right. what it right. is. Right. That's really where the key is, right? You have to know what you're doing and understand the consequences of that decision as well. You can enjoy your decision, but you also have to be ready to enjoy the consequences of the decision because nothing in the life comes without a consequence and the joy of making the decision, right? It has both ends. You can't just say, I'm just going to be happy about the decision and I'm going to complain about anything that the decision may have a a future. Like I have a very good friend who always says, if you keep investing, when are you going to live? Right. And really, my argument to them was if you keep living, when are you going to invest? And there's no right reason, there's no right, right answer. It's really a balance between the two, right? I would add a third stool to that, a third leg to that stool. It'd be if you live long enough, you need investments. You need investments, right? <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. You're 100% correct. I think the two terms which really hampering us living for living a full fit life, which is the YOLO and the FOMO, right? You live only once and fear of missing out. Right. You have to understand are most of your decisions being rationalized by these two terms? And if it is, my challenge to you, and I'm assuming, Marcus, your challenge to everyone else is probably going to be similar to that. You may not be making the best decision from a long-term perspective, right? You may need some delayed gratification there to make sure you're not over-pivoting on these two terms. Yes, life is short and you may die tomorrow. Yes, but there's a very high likelihood you may live till 100. There's a likelihood of that happening is much higher than us dying tomorrow. So you have to kind of plan for that. Yeah, I think in both FOMO and YOLO, and really probably more to the average, is that most people focus on the possibilities and ignore their probabilities. So you're right, it's possible that they'll, I guess, not outlive their investments in your scenario because they're not investing anything. But the probability is that most of us will live to 70, 80, 90. Yeah. And I'd rather be a 70, 89 year old with some type of investments that I started putting ideally away in my 20s than Correct. not. Correct. Marcus, when you are looking at helping your clients now and also as you look at your own life, what does wealth building mean for you? Well, honestly, I started saying a few years ago, putting the personal and personal finance and I try to. It was a best practice or a lesson learned for me, really. I thought everyone was driven by money as I was. I think I had that aha moment when I was in my mid-30s before I realized that. So what wealth means to me, as I said, is still financial freedom that is given to me or provided to me by money. Money for Mm -hmm. me provides the freedom I want. And then what I mean by that is pretty simple. I I quit work for a while. I went back. So I have a full-time job. I do most of this on the side. And I'm looking to pivot into it full-time, being the personal finance business. And I have an LLC. But fundamentally, no matter how much I like my job, and I do, that's why I went back for this one. It was a, I got out of audit. I'm a compliance, not that much of a vertical move. But anytime that I don't have, as you mentioned, my life in my control, which is fundamentally work. Someone's going to tell me to mm-hmm. work, wake up at 8 a.m. and go to this place, yeah. uh, office. I have an office cubicle, sit here and do this work, the spreadsheets again, although I don't have to write reports. So I'm very happy to be out of that <laughs> line of yeah. work. That is not going to make me happy. That is right. not wealth. And that's not monetary. I actually make pretty good money, but that's not a monetary fulfillment. And my mentor actually called it, <laughs> you're moving beyond transactional work. Trading right. time for money I is love no that. longer fulfilling for you. Yeah. 
That's amazing, Marcus. Marcus, what are your top three tips for our listeners when you look back um, on how to bring a balance between the two, the wealth creation and, and bad debt reduction? So I'll start with where I am now. So we've covered about 20 years in this 20 minute conversation and where mm-hmm. I am now, I actually just read. So number one, I'm on a faith walk this year. So that mm-hmm. might blow people's mind. Like this auditors on a faith walk. And that was recommended to me by my therapist. What's a faith me. walk? So having faith that if I do the right things, that it will lead to this pivot of success in this business. Because mm-hmm. the reason I left the first time is I was like, I'll be able to sustain myself doing this full time. I made good money, but it was so inconsistent. I was like, ah, this biweekly ch- paycheck is actually looking good. Right, then right. there's ups and downs, and I don't know what I'm going to make next month. Secondly, as part of that exercise, just read Simon Sinek's book, uh, Find Your Why. Yeah. And it's a two statement that he used. And my two statement as I was walking through the exercise is to find financial freedom because I think it's whatever the transition is to reach financial mm-hmm. freedom so that I can do. And I said, WTF, I want. I don't know if you allow cursing on your show. We don't. Uh, but, fundamentally, I, but I think everyone <laughs> would understand it. Because <laughs> yeah. fundamentally, that's what drives me. I thought all this time yeah. it was money. Uh, I've always been writing and doing side hustles since I was like a kid. Mm-hmm. But really, it's the creative freedom and these tools allow me to be a happy in a space in a way that I don't get from nine to five work. Yeah. Yeah. And so I guess thirdly, tying all that together is find out what's important to you. And I think a lot of people don't know that, which is why they go to work and which is why they go to school. Yeah. It's prescriptive and they tell you what to do and they tell you when to show up. And people are scared right. to figure out what makes them happy because that's right. when the real work starts. Isn't that the true estate? think for anything you want, right? Because I think what Jim Rohn always says, five years from today, you're going to show up somewhere. Is that really where you want to show up, right? So be, be clear where you want to show up. And we can really take anything in life and even finances, right? Because if you don't know what life you want to live, are you going to be happy with 1 million? Are you going to be happy with 500K? Are you going to be happy with 20 million, with 100 million? What is that number? And actually that number is not even important. Right? Because I'm sure as you're in your wealth building mode, it's really trying to figure out how much passive cash flow consistently can you get, right? And that can give you the financial freedom you want, which is the path I picked up. Because somebody asked me, what's your number? I'm like, I don't have a number, my friend. If I can generate the amount I need with 100K, that's my number. If I yep. need 5 million to generate that, that's my number. If I need $100 million to generate that, that's my number. So the number is not necessarily important. It's what amount do you need monthly and can you generate that passively? And to round about our conversations, really the less personal debt you have, the bad debt, we're not talking about mortgages, depending upon when you got it, especially if you got a mortgage at 2% never paid off, keep it forever, potentially not sell the house because you can never get that loan again. I'm not giving you a financial advice here on this show, but you have to really think hard. Do I need to pay off my 2% mortgage? a 3% mortgage for that matter, right? So you have to ask yourself, is that really a bad debt or not? To your point, earlier point, Marcus, if it's below 7% or whatever that right number is for you, whatever the hurdle is, if it's below that, does it make sense to pay that off? Marcus, this is a topic, man. It took you a long time to get your journey sorted out, like 20 years. It has been my journey, my passion in life, my life's mission to be on that journey and help others as well. So there's so much to talk about, but also we want to be respectful for your time and my listeners' time. We're coming towards the end of our show here, Marcus. Last two questions for you. One question is really around, I think we've talked, we touched a little bit on that. If you were to go back to your 20-year-old self, what's one insight you'll give them to make their migration in life intentional? In hindsight, I did pretty well. Actually, you know, it's kind of one of those multiverse questions. Like, what if I mm-hmm. did this that I think would yeah. be a good decision for 20 year old me? Then I'm like, you know, on the streets here. At 40. Poss- so I, I possibly. Look at, yeah. <laughs> exactly. I look at where I am now and where I'm going and the challenges I have and face. And I was like, you know, I would tell them to enjoy it. Or I probably yeah. wouldn't say anything to them. <laughs> I don't want to mess up the time. That's fair. That's fair. That's fair. Maybe invest in Apple or something like that. Or, you know, uh, possibly. Or possibly. Like Looking back, <laughs> yes. <IPO>. Completely. Completely. <laughs> completely. So, Marcus, the last question here is, yeah. where do you feel? Because you work with a lot of clients as well. You have a book. So, you have a lot. Of, I'm sure you have asked these questions. Where should humanity as a whole migrate towards? Hmm. 
It's a great question. I hate to be cliche, but I think we've kind of lost sight of the connection up to and including present company, an aha moment mm-hmm. that I had recently. Now I try to track my good days and I have more good days than bad, far more good days yeah. than bad. But I remember a particularly good day I had. We went out and we met with a community group that was spending our money. We had given them a grant and they were just so excited and so passionate about their work. I mean, they were my age, but they were like kids running around. They're like, oh, we got to show you this. And we bought yeah. this. And I, first of all, I was like, man, I, I barely remember when I was that excited about my work. <laughs> but I realized what it is, is they're touching it. They're out. There. Right. They're doing right. it. They're living it. And I'm back here right. behind my screen with my spreadsheets again. So I think we've lost some of that. And I think my father told me yesterday is like the way to change the world is to start with one. So I got to start with sure. me, but I need to get back out there again. I think pandemic and everything, we've lost sight of some of that. Marcus, these are, this is great. And great insight and, and really connecting with other humans and impacting somebody else's life is really what life is about, right? So I completely right. agree. And thank, I think we've lost, we've lost a bit of that, at least in this yeah. country where we are right now. But thank you again, Marcus, for being on this show, for sharing your insights. If people want to connect with you and learn more about your work, learn about your story, where can they find you, Marcus? I'm universally branded under the Marcus Garrett. Wherever you're listening to this podcast, I'm on podcast and YouTube under Life After Debt with the Marcus Garrett, where as I opened with, we have motivational conversations with your favorite influencers and entrepreneurs about their journey to life after debt. Perfect. Well, thank you, Marcus, again for spend, for sharing your insights and time with us. We appreciate it, buddy. Thank you. If you got value from this episode, you might consider sharing this content with a friend. But most importantly, be sure to take action on what you've learned. One way you can take the next step is to connect directly with Socket on an investor call. That link is waiting for you in the show notes below. The content of this podcast is for informational purposes only. Please consult your own advisors when making any investment decisions. Keep listening. We'll see you on the next episode.